good evening good evening sir good evening sir any doubt from last class okay in last class i had defined you about kinetic theory of gas in which we have then pressure exerted and thermal kinetic energy now related to this part next term will be law of equipartition of energy so first what do you mean by equipartition equi means equal and partition means division it means equal distribution of energy so on the basis of this part let me define you in last class we we have just derived about thermal kinetic energy 3 by 2 kb into t in which we have assumed that particle is mono atomic in nature for which total thermal kinetic energy will be about this much raza just tell me number of degree of freedom for mono atomic particle Minashi, yes, good. So, on the basis of which, if you distribute this particular energy into three identical half, three identical part, so along in each one part, energy will be just half kBT, half kBT, and half kBT. As for monoatomic. Number number of degree of freedom will be three. So it states the total energy of a particular gas get equally distributed along its all degree of freedom, and at constant temperature, energy in any one degree of freedom will be always equals to half kBT, and it will be always constant. Is it clear? Let me explain you again. law of equipartition of energy states the total energy of particular gas whether it would be monoatomic diatomic triatomic or any gas must equally distributed along its all degree of freedom like for monoatomic we have three degree of freedom so this particular entire energy may get equally distributed along all degree of freedom equally so at constant temperature energy in any one degree of freedom will always equals to half kbt and since temperature is constant boltzmann constant kb is also constant so this entire energy will be always constant gautam is it clear yes sir so what will be constant kb boltzmann constant and t temperature oh okay so we can say the total energy of gas get equally distributed along its all degree of freedom and at constant temperature energy associated along any one degree of freedom will be half kbt and it will be constant nabila is it clear yes sir Okay, just write it down. Okay. 
You all have written? Yes, sir. Do. Okay. So related to this part, we may define. So total internal energy U equals to number of degree of freedom F and along each degree of freedom, we have energy half kbt suppose for n number of moles of gas number of moles equals to number of particle divided by avogadro number so number of particle equals to number of moles times avogadro number so just multiply it for n number of particle it will be n times n a on simplifying it you'll get n F by 2 KB into NA times T. This particular quantity is also termed as universal gas constant. In last class, I had defined your relation KB equals to R by NA. So R equals to NA multiplied by KB. So on rearranging, you will get number of moles, degree of freedom, divide by 2 r times t equals to total internal energy raza is it clear yes sir now using this <coughs> we may define molar specific heat at constant volume so molar specific heat at constant volume cv equals to 1 by number of moles du over dt so if you differentiate this particular function with respect to temperature and divide it by n you will get f by 2 times r so this would be molar specific heat at constant volume now using mears equation Cp equals to Cv plus R. So on rearranging, you will get 1 plus F by 2 times R equals to Cp. And the specific gas ratio equals to Cp by Cv. So on solving, you will get 1 plus 2 by F. I defined you these terms in last chapter as well. So this is how we can prove these different term related to this concept of internal energy. Gautam, is it clear? Yeah, yes, sir. One second. Okay, just write it down. I 
Uh, sir, is it C B is equal to C B plus R? Yeah. Okay. Minashi, done? Yes, sir. Okay. Now let me give you a question. If four gram hydrogen is at one to seven degrees Celsius, find first number of moles second number of particle on the basis of which find number of degree of freedom kinetic energy translational part kinetic energy rotational and total internal energy. Try to solve using the above concept. All of you just please send your answer. For calculation of number of moles, you may use N equals to given mass by molar mass number of particle over of a gatro number or given volume by 22.4 liter. Sir? Yes? What is KET and KER? KE is kinetic energy and T subscript defines its translational kinetic energy. Oh. And this is a rotational kinetic energy.
Here, hydrogen will act as a molecule, so it always exists as H2 molecule. So its molecular mass will be two. Nabila, just check your calculation. Good, Minashi. Good, Nabila. Yusra, just check your calculation. Let me solve first number of moles. It will be given mass by molar mass. Given mass, we have four and molecular mass since hydrogen gas as diatomic or molecule. So it will be two. So number of moles will be two. For number of particle, N equals to Na divided by, so number of particle will be number of moles multiplied by Na. So it will become 2 into 6.022 into 10 to the power 23. Number of degree of freedom for one molecule, it will have three translational and two rotational part. 
So in total, it will have five degree of freedom. And for this much amount of molecule, total number of degree of freedom will be five multiplied by total number of particles. Krishna, is it clear? Yes, sir. Similarly, we may define translational as well as rotational energy. Kinetic energy due to translational part will be number of moles, degree of freedom that will be translational divided by two times R into T. We have number of moles, two, total degree of freedom due to translational part, three divided by two R, <clears throat> being universal gas constant may be written as 8.314 and temperature 120 degrees celsius in terms of kelvin 400 kelvin similarly rotational kinetic energy will be number of moles Sir, yes but it may take uh, f is equal to f into uh, i mean f is equal to 5 into m yeah that is total number of degree of freedom. Yeah, that's five only, right? No, no. Into n <laughs> for all the particles. Yeah. Like that, okay. So number of degree of freedom due to rotational part divided by two are 8.314 and temperature 400 Kelvin. Now, if you add these two energy, you'll get the total internal energy for this part, that is U. So U will be equals to Kinetic energy due to translational, kinetic energy due to rotational. Just add them. So for three, uh, you we can use three by two kBT, right? For you. Yeah, you may use, but for that part you have to just multiply it by number of particles. So if you simplify it, you'll get n into f by two into r t. Let me just show you. I have derived this. Suppose we have F number of degree of freedom multiplied by this much amount of energy along any one degree of freedom containing this much number of particles. So if you multiply this part, you will get this expression to be this. Is it clear? So this particular formula may contain two different parts, that is translational part and rotational part individually. So I've just break them into two different segments. Good, Nabila. Thank you. 
If you solve this part, you'll get six point zero two two into 10 to the power 24 molecule or 24 degree of freedom. If you simplify this part, two and two will cancel out. So three into four, 1200 multiplied by this. Eight point three one four. Nine point nine into ten to the power three joule. Similarly, we have rotational part, number of moves two, rotational kinetic energy, or rotational degree of freedom two, 8.314 multiplied by 400. So this part and this part will cancel out. Two into four, eight, eight into this. It will be six point into ten to the power three joule. Now add them, you'll get total internal energy. Good Krishna. Okay, Gautam, any doubt related to the entire part? Awesome. Okay. Minashi, is it clear? Yes, now, next is velocity of gas. Maybe you have three different velocity for particular gas. Let me define you. Suppose velocity and number of particle moving with that much velocity. Let's say V1 velocity having for F1 number of particle, V2 velocity for F2 number of particle, and so on. Vn velocity having F and number of particles. So first we define average velocity. Which is also called mean velocity. So V averages sum of all observation that is fi vi divided by number of observation fi similar to what we did in class 10 for a statics a statistic the last chapter of mathematics how to calculate mean related to tabular form that was fi xi divided by summation fi krishna is it clear yes sir but for whole volume like in terms of pressure, temperature, or some other quantity, it will be root under 
8 pi pi r into t divided by m, which will be equals to 8 by pi kb into t divided by small m. And it will be equals to 8 by pi p by rho. Capital M is molecular mass, small m is given mass, Kb is Boltzmann constant, R is universal gas constant, T is temperature, P is pressure, and rho is density. So similarly, next is most probable speed. You must have learned about mode in class 10th and class 9th. Do you know? What do you mean by mode? Gautam? Yes, uh, mode also is the most repeated value. Yes. Good. So similarly, in this part, in case of velocity of gas, that is most probable speed. So you will say the velocity with which maximum number of particles moving with is termed as most probable speed. So VMP velocity with which maximum particle are moving. So in terms of whole volume, it will be equals to 2RT divided by M 2 kb t divided by small m and 2 pi 2 p by rho. The last part, root mean square velocity, root mean square velocity or simply VRMS. It will be summation Fi Vi square divided by number of particle Fi. So it will be sum of observation by taking a square divided by number of observation. So it will be termed as square mean velocity. Now, if you take the square root of this part, you will get root mean square velocity. In terms of whole volume, it will be equals to 3RT divided by M root under 3 times KBT divided by small m root under and simply 3 times P by rho root under. Raza, any doubt related to these three different terms? Uh, so I think I did not get all of them. Like, how did you? get them from the beginning I'm just i've just you don't have to prove this particular entire part okay i will prove this last part that is rms velocity rest of the term is derived from maxwell distribution of gas which is not in your course okay so you have to just remember these formula and nothing else sir and average how are you taking it In first part, I'm just taking this particular term by any tabular form. If there will be a question, which is in terms of tabular form, V1, that is five meter per second, with which 10 number of particles moving, two meter per second, 15 number of particles moving, and so on. So on the basis of this observation, you may find average velocity to be this. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. This is derived from Maxwell distribution of velocity from this that part, and you don't have to define that and derive this particular segment. You have to remember only this relationship and nothing else. We will prove this particular statement according to pressure exerted by gas. I'm defining it. Okay. So first write it down. So what is the use of root mean square velocity? Suppose average or mean is taken like this. It means sum of observation divided by number of observation. Similarly, 
sum of observation by taking square, so it will be termed as square mean. And if you take the square root of it, so it will be termed as root mean square velocity. Is it clear? Yes, sir. But where is it used? Like, why is it preferred over average velocity sometimes? I'm defining you okay. this particular part, okay? So P is pressure, right? P is pressure, rho is density. Done, sir. Got them done? Yes, sir. Okay. According to the last segment, what we have proved for pressure as pressure equals to one by three rho V bar squared. In this segment, I told you V bar square is square mean velocity. So on rear ending, you will get V square equals to three times P by rho. Now take a square root on both sides. So this and this. Since this particular term is square mean velocity. So on taking a square root, it will be termed as root mean square velocity. Is it clear? And which is equals to 3p by rho, which is nothing but this expression, the last part. Gautam, is it clear? Yes, sir. So you will be able to prove only this statement. Now, why it is preferred? Velocity, that is most probable speed, it simply defines how many particles in a particular sample having maximum number of particle moving with this much velocity. There's no any specific relation to define the interacting particle in between them. So we mainly define for the interaction, average velocity and RMS velocity. Average means, suppose this is first particle and this is second particle and so on. We have a number of particles in a particular sample. Let's say moving with V1 velocity, V2 velocity, and so on. So some of these velocity divided by number of particles or number of gases term is termed as average velocity. There will be no information about their interaction. But in general, all particles themselves will be in motion with, res with respect to one another. So instead of taking average velocity, it will be better to take relative velocity and then average them. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Oh, so that, that again. okay. Since all particle must be always in random motion and for that random motion, they'll be all be interacted with one another. Also, 
there will be always colliding or collision in between them all together, always. So instead of taking each particle to behave independently and then taking each term to be moving with B1 velocity, V2 velocity, B3 velocity, and so on, it will be quite irrelevant as compared to taking a relative velocity between each of them and taking average over whole since which defines their interacting part also. So that average of relative velocity will be quite comparable with Armus velocity. That's why we take Armus velocity of gas. Is it clear? Yes, sir. So it accounts for the interaction also. Yeah. I will prove this particular related to this part and last part of this particular chapter, that is mean three part. Okay, I will define you this particular term later. Raza, is it clear? Yes, sir. Now, due to these three different terms, let me define you Maxwell distribution of velocity. It simply defines how many particles are moving with armus velocity, most probable speed, average velocity. And on the basis of which we may define how it depends upon molecular mass, temperature, and other factors. Suppose Y axis we have one by N, N is number of particle, DN over DV, fractional number of particle moving with this much amount of velocity versus V. So graph related to this part will be like this. So what is on the Y axis again? Number of particle that is one by N, which defines fractional part of particle moving with a given velocity, we have to define with respect to the whole term. Is it clear? Suppose in a particular sample, we have 100 number of particles, okay? Yes. In which 40 number of particles moving with 10 meter per second, suppose. Similarly, 30 particles moving with 20 meter per second and so on, okay? So number of particles moving with a particular specific value will define you the fractional part of dn over dv. And if it divided to the total part, so it will define you the fractional part of velocity in that particular sample. Is it clear? Yes, sir. So according to this part, the maximum number of particles will be moving with most probable speed. So this particular term will define you VMP. Adjacent to it, defines you average velocity and then V RMS velocity. So you'll be asked in a particular sample, which velocity with which maximum number of particles move. So you will say most probable speed, then next to it will be average velocity and there will be least number of particles moving with RMS velocity. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So Next RMS question. should come before average, right? Because it is actually according for the interaction. No, no, according to the number of particles, it will be velocity with which least number of particles moving in a particular sample. 
Okay. Yes. Next. Suppose this is for particular gas at a given temperature. And let's say this is for another gas at some later temperature. So you'll be asked, let's say this is for molecular mass M1 and this is for molecular mass M2. This will be at temperature T1 and this will be at temperature T2. So what will be the relation between M1, M2 and T1, T2? So first, draw a vertical line from this point on this axis. So it will define you most probable speed since I'm taking the highest point of this particular curve. So which do you think is more V1 or V2? V2. V2. Good. And V2 is for M2 at temperature T2 and V is V1 is for M1 at temperature T1. According to the above part, according to VMP, it is inversely proportional to molecular mass and directly proportional to temperature. So from this part, you can say V2 is greater than V1. It means M2 will be smaller as compared to M1. Is it clear? Gautam, is it clear? Yes, sir. Similarly, what you can say about the temperature part, since velocity is directly proportional to square root of temperature, so T2 will be greater as compared to T1. Is it clear? So, so the X and Y repeat? axis are same, right? Yes. The X and Y axis markings are same, right? The units. Yeah. Yes, Krishna. So can you repeat again uh, for T2 greater than T1? Since in this part, VMP is inversely proportional to molecular weight, that is M. So greater the value of capital M, it will have lesser VMP. And it is directly proportional to T. So greater the temperature, it will have more velocity. So in this part, which one is greater? So you'll say V2. So mass will be smaller for this part. It means M2 will be smaller as compared to M1, but temperature will be larger. So T2 will be greater than T1. Krishna, is it yes. clear? Yes, it's clear. Now, there will be next question related to this part. You will be asked to arrange these velocity on the base of their numerical value in ascending order. So just see this different term and try to find their numerical value and how they will relate in ascending order. First, tell me which is maximum part or which velocity is maximum? Average, RMS or most probable? Sir, RMS is the most. Good. Then? Then average velocity and then last most probable. Good. So to rem remember this, just remember RAM. First word is RMS, then average, then most probable. So this will be the relation according to their value. And just reverse it, it will define you their number of particles. Just like in this case. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Nabila, any doubt? No doubt, sir.
Reza, can you dial? You all have written? Yes, sir. Okay. Now there will be a question for mixture of non reacting gas number of mole will be simply sum of individual part in case of cv of mixture it will be n1 cv1 plus n2 cv2 divided by n1 plus n2 cp of mixture will be n1 cp1 plus N2 CP2 divide by N1 plus N2 and gamma of mixture will be CP of mixture divided by CV of mixture. So sometimes you'll be asked to define these three different terms on the basis of mixture of any two different non-reacting gas. Just write it down. I'm giving question related to this part. Sir, so what is the difference between big M and small M? Small m is given mass of that particular molecule and capital M is molecular weight. Okay. Like for number of moles, small m divided by capital M. So small m defines you given mass of that particular sample, capital M is molecular weight. Okay. Okay, sir. Just try to find if one mole of oxygen mixed with two mole of helium. find gamma of mixture. First tell me ox for oxygen and helium, which one be monoatomic? Which one be diatomic? Oxygen diatomic, helium monoatomic. Good. And for diatomic, number of degree of freedom will be? Helium 3, right? And oxygen 5. Good. So on the basis of this degree of freedom, you may find CV as F divided by 2 times R, CP as 1 plus F by 2 multiplied by R. Number of moles of each, N1 is 1 and N2 is 2 is given. 
Just put all the values and simplify it and try to find gamma of mixture. Keep your values in terms of R only, it will get canceled out. Good, Gautam. You sure we have to calculate for the entire part together. So gamma of mixture will be CP of mixture divided by CV of mixture. So N1 plus N2 will get canceled out. So you're left with N1, <coughs> CP1 plus CP2 divided by N1 CV1 plus N2 CV2.
good krishna and when we have one cp1 7 by 2 r n2 is 2 cp2 is 5 by 2 times r divide by n1 cv1 5 by 2 r n2 2 cp2 5 by 2 times r take r by 2 as common from both numerator so you left with 7 plus 5 into 10 divide by r by 2 as common so you left 5 plus where i done mistake just one minute n1 cv1 that is 5 by 2 n2 cv2 3 by 2 so r by 2 r by 2 cancel out 10 plus 7 17 5 plus 6 11 so it will be 17 by 11 nabila is it clear yes sir Okay. Have we all done? Yes. The last part of this chapter is calculation of mean free path. suppose you have any gases particle at this point moves along this path to collide with this particle and get deflected in some new direction let's say along this further in collision get deflected along this direction along this direction and so on along this exact path so depending upon these different collision we may define three different term first for path let's say path traveled is x1 x2 x3 and so on to xn so depending upon the these path transverse during any two successive collision if you take average of this whole path it will be termed as mean free path so mean free path denoted by lambda is average of all path length covered by particle between any two successive collision is it clear so between collision means suppose this first particle moved x1 amount of distance to reach to the second particle to get collision So the total distance tra tra traveled by this particle in between them is x1. Similarly, it may travel extra amount of distance for next collision. Similarly, extra amount of distance for next collision, and so on. So average of all these distance traveled by particle for their collision between any two different particle is termed as, or if you take the average of all these different distances is termed as mean free path is it Bra after collision two particles will be like too far away right collide collide again no no just so what are the same. chances of them colliding again yeah it may collide at somewhere else but it may, for that particular collision it may uh, transfer some different distance let's say x fifth x seventh and so on Is it clear? But here we are considering two only two particles. No, no. 
I'm just considering for this particular particle specific and trying to define only collision of this particular particle. Okay. With any other particle. So it may travel X1 amount of distance to collide with this particle, get deflected along this direction, may get collision with this particle, deflected along this way, and so on for any n number of collision I'm defining. So if you take the average of all these three different distances, it will be termed as mean free path. So you may define the average path traveled by a particle between any two sources of collision is termed as mean free path. The average distance covered by particle between successive collision. Yusra, is it clear? Yes. Now, in first part, suppose velocity of gas, let's say, will be V1. For second part, let's say V2. For third part, let's say, it will have velocity V3 and so on. I'm considering there is motion of only first particle and rest of the all particle are at rest. So I'm defining velocity of only first particle during each different collision. I will prove it later to be false, this particular part. Then I will define you about average of taking relative velocity that is equivalent to RMS velocity. But in this part, I'm just considering average. It will be easier in calculation, that's why. Is it clear? Gautam? Yes. Yes, sir. So next is average velocity equals to sum of all different velocities divided by number of collision. Now, for each collision, there will be some time gap in between them. Let's say for first collision, there's time gap T1. For second collision, time gap T2, for third T3, and so on, Tn. So if you take the average of these all different time gap between any two successive collision, it will be termed as average time or relaxation time. So next. denoted by T average or simply tau, which is equals to T1, T2, so on to Tn divided by number of collision N. So it may be defined as the average time gap between to successive collision. Nabila, is it clear these three different terms? Yes, sir. Okay. Just write it down. So what is that? Um, and tau. P or tau, okay. The same representation of torque. Okay, sir. Minashi, any doubt? No, sir. You all have written? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, just I'm giving you a five minute break and then I'm coming back. 
then I'll define you how to calculate mean tree path, okay? Hello. Are you all there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
So on the basis of these term, may define distance equals to speed into time. So mean free path equals to average velocity multiplied by relaxation time. So we have to prove this particular mean free path. Suppose there is gaseous particle having diameter D. So within the range of this particular dimension, it may collide with any other particle. Suppose there is another gaseous particle at this point. Let's say there is another particle at this point. I'm just taking any cylindrical segment. So radius of this particular cylinder from this point to this point will also be D. So total length traveled by this particular particle from this point to this point will be average velocity into time taken. So what is our red D? D is diameter of this particular gaseous particle. Given the red D is for the, the particle that is down. Just one minute. This is diameter of gaseous particle. So within the range of D, it may collide with any other particle. So I've just taken the center of these particle, center of this particular particle. So total separation from this point to this point will be 2D. That's why a radius of the cylindrical segment will be also D. Is it clear? Oh, yes, sir. So consider gaseous particle having diameter D number density n. So n simply defines you number of particle divided by volume. The more the number of particle we consider, the more will be collision. So total number of particle will equals to roughly number of collision. So it is, we can say number of colliding particle or simply number of collision. So it will be also equals to number of collision divided by volume. So number of collision will equals to number density into volume and volume of this particular cylindrical segment will be pi r square times length that will be v average into time taken. Is it clear? This is area of base multiplied by height. So this entire term will become volume multiplied by small n. So it will define you the number of collision in this particular entire volume. Is it clear? Yes, sir. So if you divide this particular delta T to left side, so N divided by delta T equals to N pi D square multiplied by average velocity. So this particular left-hand side term will define you number of collision by time taken. 
So it will be also termed as a rate of collision. Now, it's a, if you just take reciprocal of this part, so time taken divided by number of particle, so it will become one by n pi d squared multiplied by average velocity. So this particular particle, this particular term in left hand side, time taken by number of particle. So it will define the average time gap between any two successive collision, which will be also called as tau. Gautam, is it clear? Yes, sir. Now we have tau, and according to the formula for mean free path, so lambda equals to average velocity multiplied by tau, so it will be equals to average velocity multiplied by tau, which is n pi d squared v average. So v average, v average can cancel out. So lambda equals to one by n pi d squared. But there is some error in this particular result. I've just considered each rest of the particle is at rest and only one particle is moving, but will be not possible. So instead of taking average of all different velocities, will, it will be better to take average of their relative velocity. So since all gaseous particle must be in relative motion. So it will be better to take average of relative velocity. Hence, this mean free path in that segment will become one by root two times n pi d squared. So this root two get multiplied in this particular expression to define this particular average relative velocity. Gautam, is so it- why root two, why root two? It was experimentally calculated. Okay. Yes, sir. and D, D is the diameter of the particle, right? Yeah, N is number density. Okay, just write it down.
You will have Kang? Just a minute, sir. Done, sir. Mr. you have done? Oh, sir, actually, I got disconnected. So, okay. um, can, can you please scroll from uh, the average time gap between two? Okay, just, uh, just one minute. Right. I'll just take a screenshot. Done. Yustra, taken. Yusra, you have taken? Okay. So this is the entire part of this chapter, kinetic theory of gas. So for your school examination, just remember, they will ask you about pressure exerted by gas or this part, mean free path to derive. In calculation part, you'll be asked to find degree of freedom and to define absolute zero. There will be no any other question in this entire chapter. Okay? Okay, sir. Okay, let's start with new chapter that is simple harmonic motion. Yusra, you have taken a screenshot? Yusra? Yes, sir. You have taken a screenshot? No, sir, I couldn't. Okay, just one minute. From this part? Yes, sir. Okay, so done. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next is simple harmonic motion or SHM. So to define this particular part first, what do you mean by periodic motion? Minashi, any idea? Krishna? You'll say the motion of a particular body having fixed time period is called periodic motion. Just like motion of a particular planet around sun, motion of heavenly body or satellite around any planet, motion of electron and so on. So, motion of a body having fixed time period is called periodic motion. Let's say 
for an electron revolving around the nucleus. It start from this point and on complete revolving around nucleus may get reached to this particular initial position. But in case of simple pendulum, let's say string attached with any bob and oscillating from this point towards this and further back to its initial position. Both are periodic, but there is some speciality in motion of this simple pendulum. Suppose for this simple pendulum, this particular position from which it has started is termed as mean one end and this is other end is called extreme. Similarly, in this part, extreme position. So in case of electron, go hole around the nucleus and comes back to its original position. But in this part, <clears throat> if you start its motion from this point, go along this way, then comes back to its original position, then move along this way and then come back to its original position. It means for this path, motion is about this mean position to and fro or up and down. It may for different object as well. So this particular special characteristic of this motion is also called simple harmonic motion. A periodic motion in which body oscillate or moves to and fro or up and down about a fixed position that is called mean position is called simple harmonic motion. Gautam, is it clear? Yes, sir. Raza, any doubt? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, even the other case, the planet, if we take a particular point as the fixed position, then we can tell that it is moving about the mean point, right? Yeah. So simple harmonic motion is done by only pendulum? No, no. By spring mass system, by oscillating fluid. Okay. So. A periodic motion in which body moves to and fro or up and down about a given fixed position that is called mean position is called simple harmonic motion. So from this part, we can say all SHMs are periodic, but all periodic are not SHM. All simple harmonic motions are periodic, but all periodic are not SHM. So first write it down, then I'm, I'm defining you this particular behavior of simple harmonic motion, give an exam example.
You will have done? Yes, sir. One minute, sir. Done so. Now to define this simple harmonic motion, let's say uniform circular motion as SHM. Suppose we have any circular path, this. Suppose there is a particle initially at this point going along this circular path at constant angular velocity. So at some time, it may be at this point. At this point, like this. Now for each position, if you draw its projection, projection means shadow along any diametrical axis. Let's say I'm defining along X axis. So if you draw a vertical line from this point, so it will be at this, from this point, it will be at this, and similarly at this point. It means starting from this, particle is going along this way to reach at this point while yes, going along this first quadrant. Yes. Why are we taking the Y projection only? In this part, I'm taking X projection. In the next diagram, I will define you Y projection. Then on conclusion, we can say along any projection, it will be behave as SHM. Is it clear? Okay, so this is Y projection, right? The dot line X is projection, proje right? X projection, that is shadow on X axis. The, the arrow is a projection. No, no, the, it's dotted line falling on that particular axis is projection. Arrow is okay. motion of projection. Okay. But it should be a viper position, right? Because it is vertical. Suppose you have any vector like this. So if you draw a vertical line to this point and a horizontal line to this point. So if you draw a vertical line on this particular part, so length of this particular ve vector along this axis will be termed as shadow or projection of this vector along which axis, X axis or Y axis? So X axis, on X axis. Yeah, so it will be termed as projection along X axis. So if you draw a vertical line falling directly on X axis, it will define your projection along X axis. 
And similarly, if you draw a vertical line along y-axis, so from this point to this point, it will define your projection along y-axis. Is it clear? So could you tell me once more? For this particular vector, having this much amount of length, if you draw a vertical line to this point, so total length from this point to this point is along x-axis. So the shadow of this particular vector towards x-axis will be termed as x projection. Similarly, in this part, particle is at this point. So if you draw a vertical line to this point, so total length from this point to this point or from this point to this point will define you its projection along this horizontal axis, not along y-axis. Okay, so, so it's uh, x projection. Yeah. Okay, got it. Similarly, if you draw a vertical line from this point, it may fall at this. It means particle is going along this way and further to reach at this point while going along this part to reach at this point. Similarly, for third quadrant, if you draw a vertical line, it may fall at this point, for this point, this, for this point, this. So it may behave to move along this way and then to reach at its initial position. So take origin to be mean position. So it is behaving to move to and fro, to and fro about its origin. Is it quite similar as simple harmonic motion? Yusra, is it clear? Yes. Similarly, if you draw along y-axis, take vertical line, vertical line. So initially particle was at this point. So it will start from origin, may go along this way to reach at this particular highest point. In second quadrant, it will behave to move along this way and then to this way, since particle is at this point. So if you draw horizontal line to fall on y-axis, Similarly, for third quadrant, particle is at this point, this point. So draw horizontal line. So it may behave to move along this way to reach its highest point. And then So from this part, we can see the motion of projection along y-axis during uniform motion of a particle about circular path is termed as simple harmonic motion. So if you combine these two different terms, in first part, I'm taking motion of projection along x-axis. In second part, it is motion of projection along y-axis. Nabila, is it clear? Yes, sir. So we can conclude from this entire part that during uniform circular motion, the motion of projection along any diametrical axis
will be simple harmonic motion. Gautam, any doubt? No, sir. Okay, just write it down. So this is going to be the last topic, uh, concept for today. Yes. So, okay, can we leave after swapping this down? You all have written? Yes, sir. Okay, that's it. One second, sir. Okay. Gautam, you may leave. Thank you, sir. Sir, can we say that SHM is also a uniform circular motion? motion? No, no. Because like the this. motion of projection along this particular circular path is SHM, not the circular motion itself. Okay? Okay, sir. Uh, sir, can you please explain the sentence? In this part, body is revolving around this circular path. So it will be termed as uniform circular motion. It is not SHM. It's projection along any diametrical axis. Let's say in first part, I'm taking projection along X axis. So it is behaving to move to and fro about this origin. And in second part, I'm taking projection along y-axis of that particular circular motion of particle. So it is behaving to move along up and down, up and down about any given fixed point. So it will be termed as SHM, not that circular motion. Is it clear? Yes, sir. That's why I defined during this circular motion, the motion of projection is termed as SHM along any diametrical axis. Now, in next class, using this particular concept, I will derive equation of motion for that particular simple harmonic motion. Okay? Okay, sir. Nabila, done? Yes, sir. Okay, that's it for today. I will continue thank next you. class. Okay, thank you.